Welcome, everyone, to Remodelers on the Rise. I have not gone back to look, but I do believe, Vicki Suter, that you are the most frequent guest on the Remodelers on the Rise podcast. Woohoo! Congratulations. <laughs> I do have Vicki Suter again. I, I feel and honored, Kyle. <laughs> as, as, you, as you should. Um, so I want to talk about two things. One first being, um, I want to tell you about a mastermind group that Vicki and I are both a part of. It's called the Construction Consultants Mastermind. We call it CCM. We are just fresh back. Today's Tuesday. Um, last Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, 10 of us, uh, including the two best people in the group, Vicki and I. <laughs> Sorry to all of you other ones who are listening. To That's true. Uh, I mean, you can't gonna make points stating, on that one. <laughs> stating, stating facts. Um, but we had, we had a retreat every month. We get together for a 90 minute video conference call. And then every year we get together for a three day conference. And um, I don't know about you, Vicki, but I came, you know, you just never know what you're going to get from like a retreat, a mastermind group where everybody's there to help each other, to give mm -hmm. each other advice. Everybody gets a little bit of a hot seat time to talk about their business. And every time we do it, um, I'm just coming back fired up, crystal clear on my business. It was funny because my wife was struggling to find me a birthday present. And she's like, I can't shop for you. And it was the day I was coming back from the conference. And I said, honey, I just went away for three days and like talked about my business, coming back on fire, clear, no direction. Like that's a perfect birthday present. You don't have to get me anything else. She and she was like, she, stopped, she was like, phew, that's that's great. Um, so I share I share that because remodelers who are listening to this, whether you create your own, whether you find a local mentor, somebody that you really admire that's 20 years ahead of you, and you ask to buy them breakfast or lunch or dinner, whether you join something like Remodelers Advantage or a Remodeler 20 Club, or you get involved in mastermind groups I have, getting surrounded by your peers is such an energizing thing. We are in our businesses. We are in our own heads. We are... Um, you know, and, and frankly, when you get other perspectives, it just sharpens you and helps so much. What would you add to that, Vicki? You know, um, so there's two things I would add to it because I, I would concur with everything that you just said. One of the things that's really I have found hugely valuable is the fact that it's a group of people who care about me and my success and are willing to be completely honest about what they see and give me, as you say, like feedback about stuff and things that I'm, I'm challenged with or like questions that I have that give me a completely different perspective. But also it's like that group of people kind of like who have your back and yeah. who are really committed to wanting to um, like wanting to like lean in and really support you. Uh, and we don't have that as, as small business owners or, you know, even large business owners, like a lot of times there's just not that other person or those other people who give us that feedback and help us see what we're blind to. Um, no matter how yeah. hard of a worker you are, or how rigorous you are, or how many books you read or, you know, courses you take, it's very different when you have somebody who is, who is leaning into what are you about and, yeah. we, and and helping you identify where your blind spots are. And, yeah, and, it, and, it, and it doesn't happen overnight. Like any no. good community, it takes time. And, yeah. you know, even last year, there was just a really good, good feel, but just being a whole nother year together. And there's just more like, I care about how you guys are doing. And, and when you get in a group where, yes, you're there for your own selfish reasons, but the focal point and the real reason is to like help each other. Man, it's just good things come from that. Yeah, um, what a depth now you said, as you do it the you, longer. Yeah, now you said it didn't matter if you take, if read books or courses and stuff, but- Well, it does, but it's all I'm saying is, is that it's different. It's Vicky, not, it's- Vicki, I was trying to pitch your course coming up. I was making a perfect little segue of saying, now, even though you said it doesn't matter what book you read, whether it's The Profit Bleed by Vicki Suter or the upcoming course that she's putting on called Build Your Dream Team that starts on what date? March what? March 12th. 12th you know, those things are still good. You should sign up for a course, but you should also surround yourself with good people. Just let me do my thing over here. Don't, don't, okay, sorry. Don't interrupt my beautiful <laughs> flow into selling your Such course. A nice because segue it, too. Because it is a good course. But today, all we're going to do is just give the people you listening value. And what's, what's kind of funny is we were coming up with the title. There's, there's a series of questions. There's definitely a topic that I want to dig into here. Um, and, and, and we were kind of like, Hey, what's, what would be a fresh title for this? So Vicki started brainstorming it. Here's some of the things she came up with. 
ever feel like you're herding cats? Ever feel like you're pushing wet ropes uphill? Ever feel like you're a micromanager? Does managing people cause you stress? And she was like trying to figure out the best one to come up with. I'm like, those are great because those, that, that description, those four things, that's what we're talking about. Managing your team, managing your remodeling team is hard. Managing people is hard. It does feel like herding cats some days. It does feel like you're micromanaging, but Kyle, I've got a micromanager else it doesn't get done. You know, does it cause you stress? Absolutely. You know that you need to continue to improve the way you manage, improve being a better manager, but it's hard. And I want to just kind of lean into that and talk about that and tap into Vicky's knowledge and expertise on this topic today. So I want to start by not asking one of those four questions, but actually I do. Why, why like the summary of those four things um, why does that come? Why, why is that the case for most people? Why does it feel like that? Why does it feel like I'm micromanaging? Why is it hard? What would you say? Uh, you know, I think that there's a couple reasons why that happens. One is that we get in, like when we first start as entrepreneurs, that <clears throat> uh, we have complete control over what we do and how we do it and what the end product is. And then as mm -hmm. you start to add people, um, so many of us didn't learn or didn't get trained or didn't go to school to learn how to manage people. And so we want to hold on to control at the same time, want people to help us. And what happens is that we end up having people who help us, but from this very uh, like constricted place of we have to still maintain control. And what eventually happens is you add enough people and you just get tired because yeah. there's not enough hours in a day or bandwidth to be able to be in control of everything and still have a larger volume of work occur. So I, that, that's one really key reason. And I think the other thing just speaks to what I was just saying is like, we didn't get trained how to manage and lead people. And oftentimes our model is however we were managed or led as um, you know, when yeah. we were earlier in our career. And for a lot of people, it was like, you know, we, you learned on the job. I know that for me, I, you know, I learned from people who were not necessarily really great leaders. And uh, I think that there's a lot of people in the remodeling industry who learn based on being on a job site when they were younger. And then they went right into construction and sometimes running in their own business, working for someone who wasn't really well trained at managing people yeah. either. So I don't think we have good role models, I guess is what I'm saying. Interesting. Very interesting. Well, here's, here's another question to kind of dig further into the topic. How do you manage great teams? Like how, how do you, how do you do that? What's the key to building teams that produce consistent results? Um, there's a couple of things. One is, Hosted, by, that, the, by the way, I don't know if you guys are watching the video part. We videotape it. Hosting a podcast is so easy. Like I just, I asked a question. I went over, I grabbed my water. I'm just going to sip water and listen to you. Like being a host is so easy. Because you, know? <laughs> you just ask the questions and then somebody ask the question, then I sip some water, with... <laughs> I listen to smart things, and I kind of ask a little quality. It's just what a role. <laughs> Anyways, what's the key to building teams that produce consistent results? Uh, there's a couple of things. So the key to getting teams that produce, building teams that produce consistent results is that we need to let people know what those results are. So often we hire somebody and we give them tasks to do. Um, and we tell them, you know, you're in charge of making sure the job stays on schedule or you're in charge of making sure that uh, the costs come in on budget. But we don't actually give them the, like, so how often do you have to update the schedule? Or what's the tool that you need to do to you be using to update that schedule? Or um, when are you going to be doing cost to complete or reviewing the job hour burn report? And we don't give them a structure and the tools for what's the result we want them to manage. We just kind of speak to the tasks of what they have to do. And, and if, when we can, what I've seen is that, and this was true for me when I shifted my leadership style many years ago when I started to learn about this whole thing, but I've watched this with clients too, that when you start to make that shift in your mindset to 
shifting from people being helpers and just having tasks that they help you do or that they're responsible for to holding people accountable for specific results and defining what those results are for them, right? So it's like you could look at it and go, well, you know, you're a project manager. Your job is on time, on budget as promised. But the more you can codify that into specifics and what does it look like and create feedback systems within your organization to help people be able to self-manage to a specific, measurable, clearly defined goals and results, the easier it is for them to self-manage what they do and the easier it is for you as a leader to know how to and when to be doing that kind of check-in and uh, communicate, you know, your communication becomes about the result as opposed to, well, hey, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Or what's, you know, or a focus just on all of what's not working. Yeah. I mean, just even asking yourself, you, if you're managing people, am I just telling, are they just helpers for me? Am I just giving them tasks or have I really empowered them to understand what the results they need to deliver are? I mean, even just pondering that and thinking about that when it comes to your key people on your team, if it's tasks and if it's helper and it's not results and you can't measure it, then that's probably the key linchpin as to why it feels like you're micromanaging. It feels yeah. like you're hurting cats. Yeah. Interesting. Well, one really simple distinction, and this plays off of what you just said, Kyle, is that if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. So if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. So if, if you want them to manage to a result, they need to be able to self-manage and monitor what that result is, which is why instead of, um, just uh, schedules are getting updated. Schedules are updated in project, um, you know, in Microsoft Project every week by 12 noon on Thursday. Now that's specific, it's measurable, there's clear accountability, right? So even just starting to put those qualifiers around it, now they're managing their time differently because they know they have a meeting with you at three o'clock to go over that schedule. Right, so it, it just starts to shift how we engage with people, and that's really the key. If we rewind, if you guys just click rewind on your little podcast app, and the iPhone is just 30 seconds, 30 seconds. If you go back, you're gonna hear, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. And then you heard an example, the schedule updated weekly by noon on Thursday. If I have somebody, now when that comes and it's 12.05, you might not throw a fit, but you start to set that expectation. Well, it didn't work, Kyle. I did that. Okay. All right. Let's try that again. Keep consistent with it. Say, yes. hey, we didn't get this. Well, I thought, I, I, I didn't realize you. No, this is the next thing. Like, that's when I expect it. And then we're going to meet and review it. Um, a lot of this is blocking and tackling. And again, so much of it is, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed, set clear parameters and set clear SMART goals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And as much as I like to as much as I like to think it's super, super complicated, it's also pretty practical. Yeah. Managing people. And one of the things is too is just be consistent in that you've set up a structure to be able to consistently be in conversation and engaging with your team. So if I've got a project manager or two or three. I have regular meetings scheduled with them, whether that's every week or every other week or twice a week, whatever it is, depending on your company, it's going to vary, right? But just as you say, Kyle, be super consistent about it because when you start to implement change in your business, um, people are going to test you to find out if you're serious about the change that you want to occur. Like, right, we can all relate to that. Like you put change in place and it's all good for like a week or two, but then it sort of falls apart. There he goes, listen to another Remodelers on the Rise podcast and he's all fired up, but he'll implement it for a day and then next week he'll forget about it. Yeah, exactly. So you got to be consistent and, and which is why I recommend don't make it, you know, when you're first doing this, don't try to do, 50 things or 10 things all at one time. You know, if you go the most important meetings and the most important place that I need to manage better is with my project manager or my foreman or my office manager or my, my bookkeeper, whoever that is, and then, and then figure out what are the key deliverables of that position. And, and I'm happy to, 
share with everybody who's listening my six, six steps to writing a great position agreement because that's where you want to define them is in people's position agreements. Um, and it kind of walks you through step by step how to like sort of develop that. But when you've identified what those deliverables are, choose the top three most important ones and then set a schedule for meeting with those people on a, just a regular basis and make it so that like there's no excuses, right? There's no, oh, I had yeah. to go on a sales call or, oh, like, you know, uh, the, the inspector was showing up or the, you know, subcontractor wanted to meet on the job site. No, like it's a non-negotiable meeting. And if you start to develop that discipline for yourself as a manager and an owner, you're going to find that your team starts to, they're going to start to mimic your behavior and start to create that discipline as well. And, you know, it's interesting because like, I, I, when I, cause I know that, you know, as business owners, a lot of times we don't want, um, we don't want to have that restriction on us. We want to be able to have the freedom and choice. But what's interesting is when you do those meetings consistently and rigorously and, and make them a non-negotiable, what you're going to find is that your team starts to own more of the result and it will require less of your time in the long run to be able to manage and run your department or your business. And I've seen this over and over again. So, you know, part of this is just like be willing to go through the eye of the needle of creating that discipline. And when you do, you're going to find that ultimately you have a lot more freedom. Hmm. And even the question I asked there of like, what's the key to building teams that produce consistent results? That's what you were just, just describing. I, I, you know, when you look at a, uh, look at a company, look at a remodeler who's got maybe 20, 25 employees and you look across the fruited plains in Canada, the great white North, if you're listening from up there, but you look at all of those businesses that have 20, 30 employees, they have measurements. They, what, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. There's no way there's a successful modeler out there with 30 employees that doesn't have this, that isn't taking these meetings seriously, that doesn't have clear goals and deadlines and consistency in there. I think the real interesting thing is the majority of you listening are two, three, four, six, you know, person operations. And it's just as important to get these things in place if you're a smaller remodeler, because it is what, even more so for you, it's what's going to give you that next step into some some freedom of time and focus so yeah excellent. and i appreciate I a, what you said because this is the practice that this is what great companies do this is what mm -hmm. successful businesses do they have that discipline built in so that it's not you know it's not a flavor of the week they're not reactionary they're proactive and this is a way to start to be more intentional and proactive about well what's the business that i'm building right yeah. If you want it, if you want to have it be a, create a more consistent result, create an environment that speaks to more consistency and more discipline in that way. There you go. Um, so we're halfway, we're halfway through already. And I feel like we're delivering value. We are reminding, maybe even inspiring people to get involved in some mentoring and some mastermind meetings, which is just can be such a huge eye opener and help. Um, and then I've been on this kick lately where I am trying to repeat the same thing over and over again. So we, the big other thing we covered is if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. If it can't be measured, it can't be managed. Mm -hmm. And I want that to be drilled in because I'm hoping that two of you listening to this, write that down and actually realize, oh, wait a minute, that's related to defining the results I'm looking for out of my team. Cool. So this next big section is another question, which is what are three, I could say three things. You could go with two, you could go with four, but let's say three, because it is my favorite number. Do you know why it's my favorite number, by the way? Why is it your favorite number, Kyle? Because, because well, thank you for asking. I'm going to share two quirky things about me. Number one, when I am using a microwave, and let's say I put it in for 60 seconds, or often, here's what, what it is, is I have a cup of coffee, get busy with the kids, da, 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 and then cup gets cold, I usually go over and set the timer for 30 seconds or 40 seconds. And often if I'm standing there, I will open the microwave at the three second mark. That's a quirky thing. It's just it weird, quirky, right? Yeah, it's a little- when I, was, little when I was in Orlando with you, I heated up my coffee multiple times and I did that exact thing. Um, but number three is my favorite number because of the Hall of Fame baseball player as of a year ago, Alan Trammell. 
Alan Trammell was my favorite baseball player growing up. I was number three always, and I was a huge baseball card collector. You know what's really interesting right now? I just looked up at the clock, and it's 333. It's just threes. Um, but Alan Trammell was my favorite player. He was just an awesome dude. And the way I started in business was actually buying and selling baseball cards online. I was a huge baseball card collector and a huge Alan Trammell collector, and that's how I started my business. So that's why my favorite number is three. Now, was that too much? No, I thought it was great. <laughs> because, like I said earlier, it's fun. It's also, not only is it easy being a host, it's kind of fun. Um, but anyways, Especially the reason I said that. Kyle Hunt. <laughs> what'd you say? Especially when you're with Kyle Hunt. Okay, fair enough. Um, but three is the number we were looking for there. Now we've really got to lean into three. What are the three things a remodeler can do to increase profits? Just flat out talking about increasing profits. Um, what comes to your mind related to that? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is being really clear that you are actually pricing for profits. So that means that you're really clear. I mean, there's, there's kind of the obvious things like you're cl really clear about scope and you've done a good job on scope. And then there's the next obvious thing of I'm really clear on what the cost is of doing that work. I really know what it costs me to do to have that employee and you know, everybody's paying 20% more in this last year for their employees, whether that's hourly wage benefits, 401k, all that. Say that, stuff. say that again. It's 20% more for every employee. Um, cause everything, cause everything's year. increasing. Everything is. Yeah. yeah. And materials have gone up 20% with all of the things that are going out on in yeah. the world with tariff and tariffs and so on and so forth. So our costs have all gone up. So so I'm just gonna say that's a given, is making sure that you have um, a clear number and know what your real cost is for your employees with burden and, and uh, benefits and all that kind of stuff. The, but the next po most important thing, and this is the thing that I see people miss all the time, is making sure that you are pricing for profit and that you're marking up enough to cover your overhead and that you're make, marking up enough to make your desired profit margin. So knowing your overhead break-even percentage, if you take your, your overhead cost, divide it by your cost of goods sold for 2000, you know, for last year, and you come up with that percentage, that's how much you have to mark up your cost in order to just make nothing on the bottom line. And then, so once you know that number, making sure that you then mark up to make a profit. And profit is not an afterthought. That's the, the place where you begin to make and lose money is when you're doing bidding and you're figuring out what the price is that you're gonna charge. Hmm. It's making sure that you're marking up enough to make um, at least eight to 10% net profit and ideally 10 to 12%. And that's a standard of a well-run construction. And, that, and that's after the owner has paid themselves a reasonable salary, right? Yeah. That is after owner's reasonable salary. And so if you're yeah. a sole proprietor listening, that needs to be significantly higher. So, um, yeah. so, when so, those, so it's, it's interesting. Three things a contractor uh, remodeler can do to increase profits. And we're starting with just before any work is even done. Right. You can, it's, it's similar to, you know, people talk about, you know, making a profit off of like flipping a house, like you make it on the purchase. Like that's, that's where you really make it. Similarly, like if you want to increase profits, you got to be very clear um, and be pricing for profit. Um, you know, I think one, one key takeaway there, as you mentioned, everything employee burden wise, cost wise is going up, workers comp, insurance, et cetera. When was the last time that you took some time to pull up a spreadsheet, put in your folks hourly wage, and then really work through all of those burdens to make sure that you have that full burden in there before you add your markup. If, you're, if you haven't done that in a year, um, stop listening to this right now, pause it, and go, and go do that. That's a very, very important thing. Yes. Um, and, and also, they should just charge stinking more, shouldn't they? Because doggone it, they provide a wonderful service. Yeah, I have to tell you that in um, nearly 30 years of working with contractors and looking at what their pricing is, I have never told somebody that they need to reduce their prices. And what I find more often than not is people are undercharging for their services because they, quote unquote, think that that's what the market will bear or that's what they have to charge to be competitive. And the thing that's cool about numbers is that when you know your numbers, then 
you if then you're then you're making decisions about pricing with your eyes wide open and there's only two ways to affect the bottom line either increase revenue or decrease costs there's only two ways to do that either sell more or increase your markups or add services which is sell more and the only two ways to reduce cost is spend less in overhead literally or become more efficient in production which yep. leads me to the next one so oh. the second way that Beautiful you can transition. increase your profits is uh, part of what i was talking about earlier is to have clearly defined position agreements within your company that speaks to the results you want somebody to produce and that clearly outlines their accountability and so on the production side, if I have a foreman, that would include things like uh, making sure that the foreman's doing two-week look-aheads and planning out the project in advance so that you're not reacting to it. Or if it's a project manager that they're doing schedules and keeping those updated every week. But the idea behind it is that when position agreements are done well, they have people not just thinking about what's in front of me now, but they have them lifting up their head and thinking about what's coming up in front of me, what's in the future that I have to consider or I have to be paying attention to and managing to. So it's the opportunity for you to set up your team to be thinking proactively versus just reactively. So the more you clearly define that and have those key deliverables defined in each position within your business, and it's not by person, by the way, it's by position. So foremen do two week look aheads, um, project managers do schedules every week, uh, foremen do two week look aheads every week, uh, a, uh, your accounting department makes sure that all of the books are completely up to date by the end of the day every Friday, right? So that you have good feedback, like things like that are the things that produce a cons more consistent result and allow you to be more efficient, which then allow you to capture gross profit dollars and net profit dollars. All of those examples you just mentioned, I could manage because I can measure them. I'm yeah. going back to that, right? Literally, yeah. I could like yeah. time out. You're supposed to have this done by Friday. Um, the other thing, I wish if, if this was a webinar, I would say everybody in their chat box, answer this question. Um, I think it's just interesting the way you describe some of those of like realizing how much, how many hours and dollars does it save us when we are looking ahead and planning ahead? Like really think about that. It's interesting where, okay, I spent an hour just planning and working on a schedule like it seems like I'm just wasting time. I could be producing stuff. No, you're saving hours and hours and hours, like five hours, six hours for every hour of good, solid planning and pre-construction conference and upcoming schedule. Man, it just, it solves headaches. It, it improves client um, satisfaction. It reduces our scheduling time, completion date, all of that. Okay. So that's number, that's number two. And then why is number three, my favorite number again, who's the baseball player? Oh, you're, you're stretching my mind now. I'm not a sports person. I have no idea what his name was. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. It's okay. He's a Hall of Famer. He's from California name? originally, by the way. So you should definitely, his name was Alan Trammell. Alan Trammell, of course. Alan Trammell, two M's, two L's in his last name, just in case you're wondering. Thank you. Okay. You know, I was, I'm getting ready after you do your third thing to really pitch your, um, your course that's coming up like hard, even though I don't usually do that. But I was really going to say, if she listened to me and she remembers my favorite baseball player's name, I'm going to really pitch it. If she doesn't, I'm going to be like, go to buildyourdreamteam.com. Thanks. <laughs> Anyways, what's number, what's number three? <laughs> number three is um, to create a structure whereby you are consistently managing for results in your team. So at, within every department, every um, part of your team that you've set up the structure and consistent systems and structures for doing that. So let me give you an example. Um, I'll use the two week look ahead example that there's there, there's a process for that or that there is a process for change orders or there's a process for doing scheduling or there's a process for um, how estimates are done and checked and verified that if you, the more you have consistent processes about that are your way of doing that within your company, you're going to produce a more consistent result. Then you're going to create, be able to create a more consistent profit. So the, um, 
so having systems and structures in place that allow your team to be able to produce a more consistent result is key. And the, the other flip side of that is making sure that you have a, a structure whereby you're checking in with your team on a regular basis. That goes back to what we were talking about before, that you have that discipline of meeting with them with each department on a regular basis to be doing that check-in and being consistent about it. Love it. Love it. Um, that was good stuff. And I, would kinda, I was kind of trying to keep it to about 30 minutes and we're like 28 minutes in. So it's excellent. I'm really keeping it to 30 minutes because in two minutes, I got to get to my son's, start going to my son's basketball game. Um, the mighty Whitmore Lake Trojans, seventh grade, eighth grade basketball team, I think are, they're 0 and 8 on the year, in case anybody was wondering. Um, nice. They're playing the mighty. Congratulations. Yes. Um, so hopefully, we're really hoping there's one team that's kind of, they almost beat and it's their last game of the year next week. Um, I'm not really thinking today's going to do very well based on the last one, but so that's why we kind of need to wrap it up because dad's got to go watch Sonny boy play basketball, but especially the first half of this webinar where we're getting into the importance of managing our team, the position agreements, even some of what we just talked about at the tail end there. Um, since it's not something we've been trained in very well, since it is tricky and, and not, not, it is hard, but with the right tools, it becomes a lot easier. Um, Vicky does once a year and yes, because I'm in a mastermind group with her, but also because I just know from several clients who went through her course last year that this is just very helpful and will take you from crap. I need to do all the stuff they just talked about to, Oh, I've got this implemented. I've got it customized. I've got the templates. I've got the tools. I've got the training. I'm actually doing this. Um, there's a course that you have called build your dream team. That's going to be coming mm -hmm. out. Um, depending on when we publish this a couple weeks out or whenever, but why don't you share with the people, give them, give them just a real, um, Gary V calls it a right hook. Give them a real right hook about what this course is about and why they should buy it from you. Okay. So the build your dream team course is all about, um, helping you shift from being a micromanager and having to, as Kyle was saying early on, herd cats, um, to being able to um, create a structure whereby your team takes more ownership, where you're able to produce more consistent results, where you are developing the structure, the tools, um, and the, uh, the practices to be able to build a team that uh, creates more profits in your business, to be able to build an organization that great people want to come work for, and that you get the support you need and all the tools you need to be able to do that. So I've developed lots of tools in the Build Your Dream Team course. I share a ton of resources and tools for you, and I walk you through it in these six sessions that go from March 12th um, for six weeks. It's live 90 minute, and I walk you through the training, and then I give you uh, all of the tools and resources to help you implement everything that Vicky, you're learning. Vicki, the people that went through the course last year, I mean, everybody gets excited. Let me sign up for a course. Oh, I'm so excited. Um, how did people do as far as actually implementing it? At the end of the six or seven weeks, did they actually make really good progress and get it implemented? Yeah, they made huge project progress. And I'm still hearing That's from people this year about how they have implemented position agreements with their team and they're starting to see that whole um, culture shift mm -hmm. to one where they have people who are more like um, partners with them than helpers. And that's just like, that's such a relief as a business owner or a manager to feel like your team is more um, in line with a with focusing on the big picture and the results versus, uh, you know, uh, kind of um, waiting for you to make the call that there's way more proactive engagement among their team. Yeah, that's great. Um, I want you to tell them where to go here in a second. But one thing you, you said in that last part, which I think is a really big risk that a lot of remodelers have, and it's, it's just going to keep getting harder and harder to find good people. And we need to be a place where people actually want to come and work for us. We have a reputation and a culture where people actually want to work for us and good people want to stick around. So when you mentioned like, you know, these things also are key to building a culture and a business and where people feel empowered and enjoy working for you. They're not 
being managed by somebody that this day is thinking this, this day is thinking that. People like that consistency and that clear path and how do I continue to improve and, and frankly, having responsibility. So I think that's a huge thing that this year and frankly, next year, following year, 2026, 2028, it's just going to keep getting more and more important to really make sure our business is ha have good cultures. And this is a key part of that. Cool. So where, where should people go to if they want to find out more details? Um, they can go to uh, suitorbusinessbuilders.com. And if you go to, actually, you know what, Kyle, let's make this super easy for people. Okay. Um, we're going to give you a link. You can just put it at the bottom of the video. And I will give you a link for the podcast listeners that they can just go click on that link because it's kind of long. So rather than people trying to write it okay. down, it'll be in your show notes and it'll be on the video. So people can just click on that link and go directly to the course and find out everything that they need to know about the specifics and how to register. Lovely. Sounds wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, again, you're the leader in the clubhouse as far as most Remodelers on the Rise um, appearances. And I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate you sharing your knowledge. It's always, it's always fun. And I think the big thing is why do I do this podcast? Why do we put the effort into this podcast is to give value to you guys. Something that you, you forwarded me an email um, from a guy named Kurt uh, earlier in the week of some, like, hey, I listened to you on the podcast. This was from a few months ago. And it just is so awesome to see somebody that heard it that's starting to implement it, that had some questions yeah. about it, you responded back and, and gave them some feedback. You know, so we're just real people, just so you guys know, like we're just people. So <laughs> when you have questions, when you have thoughts, like reach out to us, let us help you. That's why we're, that's why we do what we do. We both, I can speak for you. We both just love helping and Absolutely. serving. And um, so yeah. awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kyla. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Yep. See Bye. Ya.